Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, this presentation is about the efforts of a group of people here and at the University of Houston to uh, not only develop a way of eliminating mitral regurgitation, but also to restore the mitral valve to normal function. And I think our experiences and some of the blind ends and things we've run into uh, have important lessons for people working on percutaneous development of uh, mitral valve repair techniques because I've seen in the literature a number of uh, things being proposed that have already been worked out as ineffective and it, it, some of this information I think you'll find interesting from that point of view. Well, the modern era of mitral valve repair began in 1967. Uh, Dr. Carpentier drew this picture himself. Uh, this was the gates to the hospital where he worked, and as he uh, drove through these gates, he describes an epiphany where he saw these two big iron gates and this masonry arch, and wondered what would happen if they were disrupted and had to be repaired. And he decided he'd have to repair the leaflets and the annulus, or the arch. He got 100 uh, dead Frenchmen and uh, did autopsies on them, and uh, he came up with this general principle that most of these people seem to have a dilated annulus. The stippled part here is the area of the dilatation, and they had other abnormalities of the cordy. And from this, he came up with an uh, arbitrary four to three ratio, which he called the golden ratio, and developed a rigid ring to restore those dimensions, and then, in addition, developed uh, resectional methods for restoring the leaflets to what he felt was normal function, uh, taking care of ruptured cordy and other ingenious techniques moving these diseased cordy from one area to another, so-called caudal transposition. And almost overnight, in the late, uh, mid to late 70s, uh, this became worldwide the number one method of repairing mitral valves. And we, we literally went from zero to 60% in just a few years. So this was a major contribution, but unfortunately Dr. Carpentier takes great pride in describing how his technique has not been altered over the last 30 years. And unfortunately, this continues to show in the results, the repairability rates have consistently <clears throat> been low in the 50 to 70% range, durability poor, 20 to 30% failure at 10 years. A big problem, systolic anterior motion, which is already being encountered in the uh, percutaneous world to a significant degree, and post-operative mitral stenosis is common because the ring site he chose was the mid-systolic dimension. So he fixes the orifice in its mid-systolic dimension even during diastole. If we look at our experience in the United States, we're still hanging around 60% repairability nationwide. So 40% of people are getting prosthetic valves instead of uh, repair. This is the MIDA study uh, directed by Dr. Enrique uh, uh, Serrano at the uh, Mayo Clinic, published last year. This is a study of people with P2 prolapses, actually flail, uh, some of which received prosthetic valves and some received repairs. And at 10 years and at 20 years, there was a 20% survival penalty for people receiving prosthetic valves. So we can no longer accept that a potentially repairable valve uh, if it's done somewhere where the surgeon's not very experienced, it's okay for him if he give it a go and then put in a prosthetic valve. This is a 20% loss of life as a result of that decision. Sam, we keep hearing from Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, and, uh, David Adams in New York, it's not a big deal, but the papers keep being published on how to deal with this stuff. And so it's still with us. The, the advocates of the Carpentier technique still have significant problems with the occurrence of Sam for reasons that are self-evident. Now this is the uh, appearance of the mitral valve as seen by Galen in the second century and hadn't changed much. It's typically described as a D-shaped annulus with a large, more or less square anterior leaf that's very mobile and then a ribbon-like posterior leaf that has two or three clefts uh, dividing it into uh, three different areas. and. Uh, this is viewed as two flaps coming together like this, re uh, restrained by the cordy and the papillary muscles. Since we've been uh, able to get 3D echo and do annular tracking, things look quite a bit different to us. Here's the aortic annulus up here. Here's an anatomical specimen. This is our typical uh, 
pre-1980s view of the mitral valve, anterior leaflet, it is indeed, when you look into the atrium, D-shaped. But in actual fact, this tissue here is the attachment of the left atrial wall. It's not an anatomical structure. And this uh, tissue, changing its histology, but nonetheless in continuity, goes all the way up between the left coronary sinus and the non-coronary sinus. And this little triangular area up here is called the intervalvar triangle. And then there's a rectangular portion of tissue here called the aortic mitral continuity. And these all join together into the anterior leaflet, forming a large, what we call anterior leaflet membrane, which encompasses this entire area here, almost twice the size of the anatomical anterior mitral leaflet. So this was a very important conceptual uh, breakthrough. The mitral valve anterior leaflet is unique in the body. It uh, forms the posterior wall of the left ventricular outflow tract in systole, and it forms the anterior wall of the uh, left atrial inflow in diastole. The entire mitral apparatus is contained in the posterior one half of the ventricle. There's no mitral structures in the anterior half of the ventricle. The aortic valve here is uh, completely free of any obstruction from the apex out to the uh, aortic valve, and uh, similarly with the mitral valve. All the papillary muscles are located in the posterior half of the left ventricle. The angle at which the uh, plane of the aortic annulus and the mitral annulus uh, join together here is called the aortic mitral angle, and that's a very important angle in terms of function because it determines the direction the blood enters the ventricle and the direction the blood leaves the ventricle. And as you'll see, these are also very important parameters to be aware of. This is the uh, appearance looking from the apex of the heart up to the aortic valve, and you can see the little triangle there and then the rectangular piece of tissue here, then the anterior leaflet. And these structures here are called the strut cordy, which are very thick, strong cordy that link the uh, right and left fibrous trigones up here on each side of the uh, aortic mitral continuity down to the papillary muscle. And these are actually the structures that uh, contribute significantly to restraining the aorta from being pushed far out of the heart during systole. So very important structural components. So what's become apparent over the years is that the mitral valve is not simply two iron <coughs> gates closing in a masonry arch, but a very complex uh, structure of which the mitral valve alone is only a part. And we really have come to the concept of a mitral apparatus, which consists of the left atrium, the mitral valve leaflets, cordy, annulus, papillary muscles, left, uh, left ventricle, uh, and then uh, in more recent years, a major contribution to uh, mitral valve function from the normal motion of the aorta. And this is a very big uh, component of normal mitral valve function. Dr. Little did a study confirming uh, uh, earlier anatomical work using 3D echo, uh, confirming that the mitral annulus moves down 1.4 to 1.5 centimeters from the end of diastole to early systole. In late diastole, the area change of the mitral annulus is reduced by 35%. This is a pre-systolic reduction in mitral area and helps contribute to the pre-systolic closure of the mitral leaflets. So the mitral leaflets are closed before the onset of systole, and that's why you don't get MR at the start of systole. You've probably all heard of the saddle-shaped annulus and how the saddle steepens. This diastole, this is systole. What we're really seeing here is the, uh, that area we were talking about up here between the, uh, the left coronary and non-coronary sinus being steepened by the uh, reduction in annular area and the motion of the aorta. As you'll see, the aorta expands during early systole and rotates, and that uh, effect causes the annulus to steepen by lifting this up relative to the trigones and the commissures and gives this appearance of a steeper saddle. You can see this motion of the aortic root here on CTA evaluation done for TAVA. You can see the aortic root here in uh, systole is expanded by about 12%, and that uh, pushes back the mitral annulus, so the mitral annulus gets smaller. And then in diastole, we get the opposite. As the root's decompressed, it becomes smaller, and the uh, mitral annulus expands. So we've got a big mitral annulus in diastole, small mitral annulus in systole, big left ventricular outflow tract aortic root in systole, and a small outflow tract 
in diastole, which is exactly what you'd want. Now, this is the motion of the aortic root we were referring to. This is a human study from Siemens. And you can see here the aortic root is rocking back and forth. And what's happening is in systole, we've got the mitral valve over here on the right of your screen, the aorta over here. And as systole progresses, the annulus, mitral valve annulus gets smaller. And then the aorta expands and gets up under the anterior part of the mitral annulus and pushes it up and back into the left atrium. And of course, the anterior leaflet is attached to, through the aortic mitral continuity to this area here. So the whole anterior mitral leaflet in systole is pushed up and back out of the left ventricular outflow tract into the left atrium. So when you're attaching rings in this area here, it's very easy, or putting in prosthesis, it's very easy to uh, destroy this uh, function here, which is very important to position the anterior leaflet correctly and get it out of the way of the septum and avoid SAM. So this is a very important thing to be aware of, the uh, expansion and rot rot uh, rotational motion of the aortic root in systole. And you can see this again here in a uh, uh, MRI study. Here's the left atrium aorta, LV. And you can see again the uh, anterior leaf of the mitral valve here being pushed well up and back. You see this rotational movement here? It's going up and back. That's the aortic mitral continuity right there. And it's also interesting, you can see there's no obstruction to flow out here. All the mitral apparatus is in the posterior half of the left ventricle. So anything we do to disrupt this area is going to cause a problem. It's interesting to note that we, in, during systole, we have the entire heart contracting, and yet during this contraction, the uh, left ventricular outro tract is expanding. Now the leaflets have to uh, uh, come together Hopefully, we're going to cooperate. So this is the posterior leaflet, anterior leaflet. The leaflets are designed to come together with a zone of apposition. And the posterior leaflet has a 50% horizontal component and a 50% vertical component. The anterior leaflet is much bigger. So its uh, uh, appositional portion is one third. So we've got 50%. Uh, 50%, we've got two thirds and then one third. And this zone of apposition is very important because the, the physical force, the hydraulic pressure during systole on this zone of apposition is what greatly de decreases the stress on the mitral valve. And it's a very important thing to preserve and restore. So this is what happens in a normal heart as systole progresses. We have the onset of systole here, the leaflet tips are just touching. Uh, mid systole, we can start to see development of a zone of apposition. The annulus is smaller, and the uh, annulus is heading down towards the apex. So at peak, city, uh, peak systole, we've got a small LV cavity. We've got maximum zone of apposition and minimal annulus size. And this is normally about a centimeter of apposition. And if we look at what's happening with stress during this uh, sequence, we can see that if we plot stress across here and the zone of apposition or coaptation here, we can see that as we go through those same three sequences you just saw, that the coaptation <coughs> surface increases. And as that increases, the thin, weak, uh, marginal cordy uh, don't get any more stress on them. But the stress is progressively transferred under those thick, strong strut cordy you saw earlier, and finally all the way out to the annulus. So at peak systole, there's very little uh, stress or strain in this area here. We've got some strain being taken by the strut cordy here, and then the bulk of the strain, the maximum strain, is being taken by the annulus, which is the strongest part of the whole mitral valve. And we've been doing extensive work here with uh, Dr. Zogby and his colleagues and the University of Houston on strain measurements on our patients. And this is what a normal patient looks like. Blue is low strain and red is brown is high strain. And you can see in a normally functioning valve, there's very little strain uh, around. Uh, it's a very beautifully uh, designed structure, which goes typically two, two and a half billion beats with almost uh, uh, glad wrap thick uh, components. So it's a truly a remarkable thing. So uh, we've talked about the fact that leaflets are together before the onset of systole. But not only are they together, they are locked together. They are strongly opposed. And the final phase of this coming together before systole is called diastolic locking. And this is a well-described phenomenon. Uh, 
Uh, those of you who've had an interest in atrial fibrillation will know that people with atrial fib, amongst their other burdens, uh, tend to have uh, early systolic uh, mitral regurgitation. And this is because if you eliminate atrial function by developing atrial fib or uh, doing dog experiments and injecting chemicals that eliminate the muscle in the atrium, you lose diastolic locking. The significance of this to us is that this is a passive phase of the cycle. This is the passive filling of the heart. The ventricular geometry is such, the cordy, papillary muscles and the leaflets are, if you, as you inflate the heart and you make the annulus smaller, those leaflets will come into this state of diastolic locking that is maintained by the filling of the heart. So this provides us with a way of simulating this point in the cardiac cycle passively with an arrested heart. And this is what we do. We mark the zone of apposition here. That's the 70-30, and this is the 50-50 back here. And then we use these uh, uh, stay stitches here to simulate that 30% reduction in the area of the mitral annulus. And as we inflate with the annulus dilated, you can see that the, nothing much is happening. But as soon as we roll, with the ventricle filled up, as soon as we roll the annulus forward, we get the diastolic locking. So this just illustrates the important interplay between the mitral annulus, which is not a passive standby where there are just a couple of hinges there holding the leapers. This is actually an important dynamic component in the function of the mitral valve. And here we are, we put an annuloplasty ring on the correct side and as we, as we blow the heart up, you can see the saddle steepening here and this uh, flexible ring allows three-dimensional uh, normal uh, behavior of the mitral annulus in this repair. But that's the simulation of end diastolic locking. And uh, those of you who work on cars will know the significance of top dead center. That's a way of uh, getting all the pistons, valves, camshafts, timing chain, everything at one point. And once you get everything lined up at that point, you start the engine, everything else will go all the way through uh, in the correct sequence. And this is the same thing. If you've got everything right here, the rest of the cardiac cycle will function normally. Now, the mitral annulus in uh, myxomatous disease typically uh, uh, flattens out. This is the normal. This is work from Mayo Clinic. And you can see the saddle steepens, as we've discussed. And in myxomatous disease, the annulus is typically very dilated and flattened out, and you don't get as much uh, steepening during systole. So annual dilatation is really bad. Uh, it decreases leaflet apposition, uh, decreases this pre-systolic reduction in annular area quite a bit, and therefore leads to marked increase in leaflet stress, caudal stress, uh, and the marginal cordy take a lot more because the leaflets end up hanging off the cordy. And just recently, the, the uh, knitting needle therapy for the uh, prolapsing mitral valve leaflets had a problem because some of the cordy had been pulling out of the edge of the uh, leaflets. And the saddle is flattened because of the annular dilatation. So here we ha have uh, the problem now of SAM, which we mentioned. Uh, there are very few uh, naturally occurring causes of SAM uh, that we get to see. And the main one we get to see is when we're working on hokum patients. And about 70% of patients with hokum, as you know, uh, have SAM as part of their dynamic obstruction. These are very easy to fix. You just have to do a very thorough uh, resection of the hypertrophin. Even though the leaflets may be a little abnormal in, in uh, hokum, it's very rare to have to do any kind of repair on the leaflets themselves, unless they have ruptured cordy or some other secondary problem. So we get back to what's causing this epidemic of SAM in the Carpentier technique. And uh, the problem is that if you view the leaflet uh, view the annulus is running around here, that's the natural place to put a ring, and the natural shape of that ring is going to be a D-shaped ring. But what you're actually doing here, if we transilluminate from inside the aorta and we see the fibrous triangle, the aortic mitral continuity, and then the left atrial attachment here, if we go from trigone to trigone, what we're actually doing is putting a bar across the left ventricular outflow tract. Instead of that left ventricular outflow tract being able to expand and systole back up into the atrium, we're now putting a rigid <coughs> bar across the left ventricular outflow tract. So those who fail to uh, understand history are doomed to repeat it, and those who are making D-shaped uh, uh, rings 
uh, to do percutaneously are going to have SAM unless they get rid of the anterior leaflet. And here you can see a paper doing just that, investigating uh, the uh, impact of a D-shaped ring on the uh, mitral annulus and the left ventricular outflow tract. Left atrium, left ventricle, this is a bit like that uh, MRI we saw. And here you can see the uh, aortic annulus is right here, and we're down the anterior leaflet about one-third, and we put the ring in, and this prevents the uh, left atrium from uh, the uh, mitral annulus from enlarging, so you get mitral stenosis, and it keeps the uh, anterior leaflet towards the uh, septum, so you get SAM and left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. And this was an MRI study from uh, Italy showing the same type of thing, uh, basically a rigid ring here positioned in the D-shaped area. Same thing, mitral stenosis, uh, paralyzed anterior leaflet displaced towards the septum. So we know what causes it in uh, Carpani disease, but still people continue to use rigid rings. This is just a little thing in the lab with a pig looking down into the mitral valve through the left atrium. And this is the aorta coming down here. So in the, in the lab, we can put our finger in, and then we can push upwards and backwards, simulating that motion of the aortic root upwards and backwards into the left atrium. If we sew a ring tightly across here, trigone to trigone, and have a rigid area here, when we push upwards towards us, uh, you don't get much change in the position of this area. So it's stuck in the diastolic position with the mitral leaflet displaced towards the septum. If we sew a lot of slack into the ring here and carry it up around the edges of just, uh, just below the uh, aortic leaflets here, then we get this bucket handle-like structure that can move way up into the left atrium. You can see it bulging up towards us here. And when you do that, SAM goes away. And this concept here from the uh, Cleveland Clinic, uh, which is a very good paper, you, you can see here that when you put a uh, rigid ring in, the aortic mitral angle here goes to 90 degrees, so the flow of blood from the left atrium into the uh, left ventricle directs blood against the anterior leaf and shoves it up against the septum. And that's really the cause, not big leaflets that have to be trimmed down. And this aortic mitral angle is therefore critically important to preserve when you're repairing valves or you're placing prosthetic devices percutaneously. Another very important element in mitral valve closure and uh, normal uh, systolic function is the fact that in, uh, during late diastole, the large clockwise vortex forms. This is the mitral valve here, inflow, apex, and LVOT. A large vortex forms at the apex, and this sort of slingshots the blood around and out the aorta. And this vortex forms because of friction on the edge of the leaflet here, which slows this side, and this side keeps going, so you get, that leads to a vortex, and that vortex uh, helps uh, the anterior leaflet move up and out of the way here and promotes a low energy transfer through the 180 degree bend here the blood has to go through to come out the aorta. So vortex generation and preservation of that is also a very important thing we need to look at when we're looking at new devices. Mitral, classic mitral prostheses, when they're implanted, lead to reversal of the vortex. So now as the blood comes in, it goes into a counterclockwise vortex. <coughs> this is mainly because every prosthetic device produces a 90 degree aortic mitral angle, which directs the flow of blood against the septum where it bounces off and you get the vortex and then the blood has to make its way back across the ventricle and out the LVOT. In this study, which compared that with mitral valve repair, vortex generation was much more preserved, and you did have, in fact, a uh, clockwise vortex with these repaired valves. So we've talked about how we can simulate uh, uh, a good spot to get all these different dimensions and expansion of the aorta, movement of the aortic root. All this stuff can be simulated by using this uh, a diastolic locking point and inflating the heart with saline. And that's what we do. That's what our technique hinges around. And we have a, a little uh, general surgery suction irrigator that pumps four liters a minute with a little electric motor. And if you watch here, we've got the aorta here and the mitral valve here, and we're just passively inflating the ventricle. And if we watch this again, you'll see the aorta expanding elongating, rotating towards us, and the aortic root is right here, and it's expanding and pushing this area here upwards and backwards into the ventricle. 
So if you watch this area here, this saddle is steepening and it, this part is rotating upwards and backwards towards us. So this, in fact, this simulation, in fact, does simulate a passive component that corresponds to that in the normal cardiac cycle. So we recommend using uh, flexible rings and the size of the annulus is critically important so we want it to be adjustable so during our simulation we can um, get a perfect uh, dimension for the annulus. The strain measurements we've been uh, taking confirmed previous work from Salgo and a number of other people showing that uh, red is bad and blue is good. This is what a uh, mitral, mitral valve with a flat rigid annulus and trimmed out flattened leaflets looks like from a stress point of view. And this is what a flexible uh, annulus with uh, three dimensionality preserved and uh, big leaflets, big floppy leaflets looks like. Much extremely greatly reduced stress. And most of the failures, most of those 30% failures with the Carpanier technique, you can see here, relate to things. The heart's trying to get this thing, the, these rigid things off it, and it's trying to get its normal shape back. So we have annular dehiscence, annular plastic rings dehisced, and this is the suture line from where that leaflet resection was performed, and that's dehisced. So high stress and strain is a feature of the Carpanier technique, and that's what leads to these high failure rates. So uh, several years ago, we uh, reported on our first uh, seven or 800 patients using this new technique with uh, about four or five years follow-up, and uh, we achieved 100% repairability by not only doing our contribution to the uh, uh, effort to make the heart not have mitral regurgitation, but by preserving what the heart's trying to do all the time by itself, which is close and open the mitral valve. And if you preserve those mechanisms, you've got to leg up on being able to uh, repair more people. And so we've now done over a thousand consecutive cases using these techniques with no replacement. And uh, we attribute this, uh, and the durability now, uh, we've got enough patients now that we've seen some very interesting things in durability. We just published a uh, small paper earlier this year, and for the first time ever, uh, any, in the experience of any group, we've been able to show that our technique reduces strain in these disease valves to a lower level than the uh, normal level of strain occurring in a normally functioning mitral valve. And we believe that low strain on these uh, diseased valves is going to lead to longer durability, and we now have some data to support that, which I'll show you in a minute. Notice the tremendous reduction we're able to make in the annular dimensions here and the restoration of that, uh, that zone of apposition by uh, this repair technique. So we've got a big P2 here, huge P2. Don't resect it, take advantage of it. We use artificial cordy. We mark the zone of apposition. We adjust the cordy. We get everything perfectly aligned. We want our zone of apposition to be absolutely perfect. We do our inflation. We pull the annulus forward, select the correct size ring, and this is what we end up with. And you notice how our ring here looks just like the uh, 3D echo tracking. So it's a totally different approach to the uh, annular plastic. And here post-op, there's not one bit of uh, SAM or anything else and big LVOT. Anterior leaflet's been a big problem at Cleveland Clinic and Mayo Clinic. This is a Mayo Clinic paper. And just last few months, a Cleveland Clinic paper both showing problems repairing anterior leaflets. So we've got a huge anterior leaflet. And here's our post-op using these same exact techniques on the anterior and posterior leaf. There's the cordy, there's a the big left ventricular outflow tract, no SAM. So you don't have to resect these leaflets if you preserve the normal uh, mechanism designed to keep the anterior leaflet away from the septum. Barlow is a very big thing people have trouble with. We use the same exact principles. Here you can see the pre-op. We mark it up, select the correct size ring. And here you can see post-op, much smaller annulus no SAM, and this dynamic behavior, that's the aortic root there. You can see it bulging up and back, carrying this part of the annulus up, back, and out of the left ventricular outflow tract. And for those of you who are, who are very interested in, in Barlow's, uh, uh, we published this paper in uh, Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular in 2015, which is a complete review. Uh, Dr. Uh, Little and uh, 
Dr. Ben Zikri, who, uh, who's uh, in Israel, is, uh, did this study with us, just comparing the uh, uh, Carpentier technique, which you see here in the red, and our technique in the black. And uh, if you just look here, uh, this is the dimensions of the, the area of the mitral annulus throughout the Kodak cycle, end diastole, mid systole, end systole, mid diastole, late filling, and diastole. And basically what you see here with the technique we've recommended, we have a reduction in the annular area by mid-systole, and then it widens out and gets big during mid-diastole. Uh, the Carpentier ring, as we mentioned, is designed to maintain mid-systolic dimension throughout, and so that's what you see here. <coughs> now, when we look at the actual morphology, we've been working with the University of Houston on ways to uh, document the shape of these uh, annuluses, and here you can see the results of some of these mathematical techniques they've done on our uh, echo tapes we've sent them. This is a normal control. This is big organic mitral uh, regurgitant annulus flattened, and here's our post mitral valve repair. And these post mitral valve repair annular uh, uh, configurations are extremely similar to the normal. So this technique does lead to normalization of the annulus. This is the left ventricular outflow tract. It's been studied by Dr. Shah. We've got some work coming out on this soon with more detail, but basically just to summarize, the techniques we've used preserve the normal systolic expansion of the left ventricular outflow tract and the normal aortic mitral angles. They're both very similar pre and post-op. So normal LVOT functions also being preserved. So just to finish up, uh, my personal experience with mitral valve surgery is now 2,700 patients, of which 2,100 are repairs. And for the last 10 years, as I mentioned, we've had 100% repairability in degenerative myxomas, degenerative myxomas and ischemic. Uh, the people with damaged leaflets, unfortunately, we don't have a good substitute for significant leaflet disease. We use pericardium a little bit for small areas, but for the people with functioning leaflets, all people with functioning leaflets can be repaired. We like to make sure we're not missing any things that we might have uh, failed to tabulate as uh, replacements. So along with our repairs, we always publish all our mitral valve surgeries, and these are the replacements. And after 2002 here, you do not see any degenerative ischemic or myxomatous appearing. It's all rheumatic and other diagnoses. So this is just how much we reduce the annular area. The pre-op area is a big 19 to 20 square centimeters, and we reduce this to about eight square centimeters. And you can't do this if you're not preserving the normal motion of the leaflets so you, so you don't get SAM. This has a big impact on this uh, strain. Surgical risk for isolated P2s, which is sort of a standard reporting parameter, is 0.2% overall mitral 1.6. Combined procedures, 2.3. Age doesn't have much impact on uh, mortality. This is a very safe procedure, even in the elderly. Now, this is uh, right down the very bottom here. You can see our experience and incidence of SAM. This is at the time of discharge. And our incidence runs in the range of 1%. And this is, we've never had to reoperate anyone for SAM. This is non clinically significant SAM that usually resolves within three months. Freedom from your operation, very similar for anterior, posterior, and uh, bileaflet and barlows. And this is the data I was telling you about. Our uh, reoperation rate at the five year mark, most reoperations occur at three years, so we've got cohorts that are followed for a full five years, and you can see this progressive reduction. And over the last five year cohort ending in 2017, our reoperation rate is approximately one half of 1%, down from uh, 10 to 15% using the older techniques. So we think that this uh, uh, tremendous reduction in strain on the leaflets has had a major clinical impact. So uh, what we can see is that careful attention to the functioning of the valve and the restoration of these functions has uh, led to 100% repairability. We've not resected a single leaflet since 2001. We've eliminated SAM, and durability has clearly significantly increased. And if I could just have one more moment, I have an important health alert for everyone. Uh, 
properly performed surgical mitral valve repair remains the gold standard for operable patients with preserved leaflets and severe MR. There is no other therapy that can match its low surgical risk, completeness of elimination of MR, absence of SAM, and durability. This is quite a different story from TAVA, a very different story from TAVA. The mitral valve, even with a, a bioprosthetic prosthesis, we know has a very limited durability. So it's very important when you're looking at a perfectly repairable valve not to think that a uh, percutaneous valve replacement might be an option. It is absolutely not an option because there's no data whatsoever showing that that's going to be even remotely comparable for these patients. Thank you very much. So, Gerald, you're saying you're almost as good as a mitral clip. Just kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But believe me, I am a big fan of the mitral clip. And as you know, I'm, I'm one of your most ardent referrers of people with mitral clips. Uh, there are definitely uh, categories of patient who are simply not really operable with any reasonable degree of uh, safety. And the mitral clip uh, definitely has a major, in fact, at one of these meetings, I complicated the inventor of the mitral clip on his tremendous work because it's, yep. it, for us, the deal with these very sick patients has definitely been a huge advance. I'll just comment on your presentation. So I've seen versions of your presentation over the years, and it's amazing how you've layered in more and more compelling data that's more and more relevant to transcatheter technologies and even the imaging as well, of course. And I think if we all appreciated the mitral valve the way you've shown us to, we'd have a lot fewer false starts, both in technologies and in imaging, because it really comes back over and over and over again. So thank you.